Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar from AppSec Engineer on role-based IT security training, can it suck less? And the idea is obviously that, yes, it definitely can suck less. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we've seen, and especially I've heard of over the last couple of years that have really influenced this topic for today. So that's one of the things that we'll be looking at today. I'm going to be talking you through some of those things that you can do to make this whole thing suck a lot less. So... We're going to look at this, we're going to talk about a few strategies, some case studies and so on, and we're going to get into this topic in a little bit. Now, just for your information, this is something that I think is going to be very useful for you if you are managing an application security program or a product security program, especially for you, those of you who are doing that, simply because you are the folks directly on the front lines of something like this. And even if you are not, so let's say you're somebody in learning and development, somebody in the security space in general, I think this will make a lot of sense for you. Now, with that in mind, let's get started. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And we're going to get cracking and get started with the slides for today, which is why security training sucks and what we can do about it. This topic has been something that's very close to my heart. It's been something that I've had a lot of experience with, especially over the last couple of years because of AppSec Engineer and the fact that AppSec Engineer is being used extensively in the enterprise. So that's the reason I thought we'll talk about this and look at some of the things that work and some of the things that don't work, right? So this is really about bringing out some of the issues that we've seen and some potential solutions for those issues. It's really more about the issues and some of the things that you typically see and what can be done about this. What are some of those strategies that you can apply to do something about this is something that we'll be looking at, right? So first of all, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Abhay. I am the founder and head of research at AppSec Engineer. I also run V45, which is our application security services company. I've been doing training for the last 12 years and I've had more than 16 years of experience in application security per se. I created the world's first DevSecOps course. I train very extensively, both in instructor-led training as well as I do a lot of courses on AppSec Engineer. And I train at OWASP, Black Hat, DEF CON, and so on. And I also do a lot of work in the threat modeling space and in the open source space. One of the things that I'm more known for, especially online, is the creator of AppSec Engineer. AppSec Engineer, for those of you who don't know, is a hands-on training platform for application security, cloud security, Kubernetes, and so on. It's a full-stack hands-on training platform. So that's really what AppSec Engineer does. And we work with individuals, we work with companies that need their training needs fulfilled. So that is something that we do. You know, let's get directly into it. I'm not going to waste too much time. I'm going to go directly into the topic and start talking about what you can do with this particular issue itself. Let's get started with our topic. The agenda is going to be essentially this. We're going to talk about a few problems and we look at the scale of some of these problems because the scale of some of these problems are pretty huge and especially the way we do them today, right? The way we deal with them today is is quite bad and we there is a better way out there. We have to look at that way and we're going to look at how we can address the scale of this issue with the product security problem. We'll talk about role-based security training. Now, you might have heard this term role-based security training has become a very important term, especially for people who want to roll out training programs across multiple teams and multiple types of different business units and within the same team, role-based security training has become a very, very important term. So we look at what that means and what that is. We'll also look at some of the scaling and monitoring challenges for doing security training, especially because within the organization, you're likely to have, first of all, a geographically distributed workforce. You're likely to have thousands or hundreds of thousands of developers. We've had customers that would have tens of thousands of developers or engineering team members who've had to do something like this. What are the ways you can scale with this, how you can roll this out? And we'll also look at the issue with too many tools and finally come to some conclusions and some success factors related to how you can roll out training. And of course, towards the end, I'm also going to be taking some questions from people in the chat. So that is something that I'm going to be looking at today. Let's talk first about the product security problem. I don't know if you've heard of this term product security, but it started to make a lot of impact, especially nowadays, because the way application security done is really more about how products are delivered in the real world. So today, if you look at the way applications are delivered, they are really delivered by teams that are more engineering driven. Now, what does this mean? In the simplest terms possible, it essentially means that teams today are more dev centric, which means that earlier you would have two distinct groups of people. You would have dev and ops, and the dev would create the software, ops would deploy the software. But today you see that dev has kind of cannibalized a lot of these capabilities because even ops is really dev, right? It's different types of dev. 
and it's become more engineering driven. So which is why you are seeing trends like this, right? So 83% of developers performing DevOps activity as part of their daily activities. This is from Spacelift Research in 2024. In fact, any team today that I work with, large, medium, small, you see the developers, especially if they're small, you see that developers tend to play multiple roles. And even if they're large, developers still tend to do a lot of work around the cloud space, around the DevOps space. They have their fingers in many pies, and which is something that we're seeing quite a lot of nowadays. 62% of teams use containers for deployment. Now, in my signal for are engineering driven is basically the fact that a lot of people use containers. And the fact that if you're using containers, there's a good chance that you are driven by engineering because a lot of the container driven development is dev centric, right? The way you would package containers, run containers, manage that entire container workflow is very dev centric. And containers are a signal as far as I'm concerned that they are very engineering driven. Also, one of the things that because this is happening, because it's engineering driven, because there's a lot of DevOps happening everywhere, you're also seeing that teams are liking this, right? They're reporting 68% reduction in deployment failures. And this is from the Dara 2023 metrics. This, we are seeing a real world scenario where people are reducing the failures in terms of their deployment just by using DevOps, which means that this is not going to stop. This is going to be an approach that's going to keep getting bigger and bigger over time. You're going to see engineering driven workflows being the way that people are going to deploy applications. So I don't think this is going to change anytime soon. And according to Gartner, 80% of engineering teams will move towards platform engineering, which is really your DevOps plus plus, right? So where you're engineering platform centric tools to make sure that your applications are delivered faster, delivered better, delivered more stably and so on. So you are seeing teams today becoming more engineering driven. Now, what does this mean? And what does engineering driven mean? And what does this entail from a security training perspective? So essentially what's happening is that you are moving towards an AppSec world where you only looked at the security of your apps to a more holistic product security world, where you are looking at the overall security of the product, which means that not only are you looking at the secure coding or application security aspect of it, you are looking at cloud security, you're looking at detection engineering, you're looking at supply chain, you're looking at cloud native, you're looking at security engineering, you're looking at threat modeling and security architecture, even more, maybe even add more domains to it, maybe perhaps around AI driven driven security and ML driven security and so on. So there's a lot of stuff you're doing, which is now being encompassed in product security. So just not securing your apps itself, which is one part of it. It is also how you are securing the environments, the workloads, the network, the detection part of it, the supply chain security part of it. All of these things are becoming problems that your team, your engineering teams are dealing with. And these are all engineering problems in the true sense of the term. Now, when you're dealing with engineering problems, you will notice that you need solutions or you need training that is oriented towards engineering solutions, which means that you can't just stop at saying that, look, I'm going to teach my developers how to fix SQL injection and cross-site scripting and stuff like that, but I don't really care so much about them understanding how to deploy things more securely, how to handle secrets, how to use OAuth and OIDC, how to use all of those things obviously make a big difference. They need to know those things as well. Not just developers, but also you have to start extending the whole training to other people who are outside of your typical development archetype, which is your, you know, your DevOps engineers, your cloud engineers, all of those people also need to understand security and from that engineering perspective. So your training, unfortunately, today is just sitting on the tip of the iceberg, which is your secure code training. But if you think about it, there is a ton of stuff that you still need to do that you're not getting to because you've just not done it, right? A lot of companies just don't do this. They just look at, okay, I'm going to train my developers on SQL injection, so on, and do the standard stuff, just check in the box stuff, and that's it. I don't really care much about anything else. Now, this is not working. I've seen most of the people who talk to us, especially within medium and large enterprises, automatically talk about the fact that, yeah, we are multi-cloud, we have DevOps, we are extensively on either GitHub or Jenkins or GitLab, whatever it is. We have a bunch of Kubernetes, we have detection engineering, we're doing with Microsoft sentinel or something equivalent they're doing all of this stuff and we also want to set up a security champion training program we know are using ai and llms with our product so we really need to think about security of all of this and awareness of security of all of this is still pretty low so one of their big challenges is to break out of that whole thing of just saying okay secure code training is one thing but secure coding is not the only thing you need to think about the overall engineering security training which is all of this stuff including things like threat modeling and so on 
So just doing this sort of basic stuff where you say that, okay, we're training them with these spot the bug quizzes or spot the bug scenarios. Most of the people we speak to have started getting tired of this, right? The developers are tired of this. The people running these programs say there's no engagement. It's very clear that this is something which is a huge problem. And this is a problem that is there to stay because we are not addressing it the right way. We are still thinking that we're giving them the right training, but you're giving them, you know, one-tenth or one-twentieth of the actual training requirement that you have. And the worst part of all this is you're doing it in a bad way. You're doing it in a very theoretical or in a very simplistic way that developers don't really enjoy. It's not realistic. It's not scenario-based. It's not hands-on. It becomes a big problem, right? So this is something that we hear a lot of when we speak to people. Now, let's talk a little bit about the term, which is role-based security training. Now, role-based security training is something that you see everywhere, right? If you look at PCI DSS, if you have some compliance mandates, you're looking at role-based security training. If you're talking to your customers, you have customer contracts that mandate security, you're looking at role-based security training. The references to role-based security training in all of your compliance requirements, your regulatory requirements, even your customer contractual requirements, your internal security requirements, all of them are talking about role-based security training. Now, what does this mean? Is it just mean that your role, the person, whichever role they have, they should have some security training? Partially, yes, but it's also this, right? Now, the idea of role-based security training is that just read this as relevant security training. Now, relevant security training means that people by role, by stack, by tooling, by language, by framework, all of these things make an impact on role-based security. You can't just go and teach an AWS cloud engineer. You can't just go and tell them some basics about cloud and expect them to be engaged in your security training. This is, again, becoming the problem because most of the training out there is very generic. It's super basic. It's videos. It's very simple Terraform scripts and stuff like that. It doesn't make any difference, which is why you are seeing this sort of initiative within organizations crumble. Simply because this only works when it is relevant to not just the role by their horizontal role, but also has subcategories like the stack. So let's say you are a developer who's working on Kubernetes and you are working on Go. You should have content for all of this stuff. Or let's say you are a cloud engineer who's working on GCP and you're deploying stuff on Argo CD and using, you know, let's say Python, you need to have content for all that stuff, which is where role-based security training should work. And this is something that you see defined very specifically in standards like PCI and defined in a slightly more implicit way in other standards. All of these standards require you to have role-oriented or responsibility-oriented training for security. And the only way to do this is to be very clear that there are not just, you know, broad role categories to say, that, okay, this is an architect, but also to say that this is an architect who's working on this cloud provider with this particular set of technology. So you need to have training that cuts across all these things. Only then it is relevant. Otherwise, it ends up being mostly irrelevant. So role-based security training is something that you definitely need to think about, definitely need to focus on quite a bit when it comes to your security training program. The other issue, and this is probably one of the biggest issues outside of the whole relevance thing, the interest part of it and so on, the engineering-led part of it is scaling and monitoring. Now, we talk to companies that have hundreds or thousands of engineering folks, and they need to train them. They're sitting in different parts of the world. They're working in different time zones. So obviously, traditional training approaches don't work. But the thing is, traditional training approaches give you some value because they give you the ability to have a lot of hands-on exercises and so on. But at the same time, you can't do it because you have to scale it across hundreds or even thousands of people. So what we've seen is that, look, one, the people running these programs are always worried about this stuff, right? We're always following up. We don't ever have data. We don't have the tools to do this effectively. It ends up always being this, chasing these people and never getting it done. It, it's boring. So you are looking at a cascading set of problems. One, the training is not relevant, thereby not followed. The training is not comprehensive, thereby not followed. The training is very basic, kind of boring, thereby not followed. So as a result, they're always stuck in this situation. So you see that garbage always flows down. So they're stuck in the situation where all of these problems happen because they're always following up because it's boring. Nobody wants to take it. Nobody wants to do anything about it. The data and the tools don't do this effectively. We don't have reports. This is the biggest thing that we've heard really when we talk to people. There is no reporting that is capable of doing a lot of this, right? The reporting across multiple parameters, multiple dimensions, all of that stuff is needed, but people don't have it. As a result, it doesn't get measured. It just gets lost in the ether. 
and remember reporting is also required when you have to present audits uh, or audit evidences to your your auditor like a pci auditor or whoever it is you need these reports to work and that's something that you should think about there's no way to incentivize a lot of times you'll see that you're just doing these trainings but there's no real incentive to doing it you're not getting the right incentives to get people to do this properly right and while the training quality is very important the incentives are also equally important some of our most successful clients what they do is they have very strong incentivization for training because they offer things like okay collect as many badges for the number of maximum number of courses you've done or challenges that you've completed on the platform and you get some incentives like some amazon gift card or you get some additional benefits at work and so on so the problem is again all of these things need to be managed in a very very cohesive way and that that tends to be something that doesn't happen in most training programs that we see we can't scale these people we can't make sure that they get the best quality hands on training which is why a lot of these training initiatives fail so the conclusion that people come to after having all these issues so you have bad training that is not relevant that doesn't have the right reporting doesn't have the right feedback mechanism doesn't have the right incentivization system and doesn't scale across your population of developers or engineering teams and the conclusion that people draw is they don't care about security so you take all the worst possible things but you come to the completely wrong conclusion based on those worst possible things which is obviously not the right conclusion to derive so the idea should be that you need to think about training that cuts across all of these different elements and is very relevant is hands on is full stack and engineering driven it should have the right incentives in place it should have reporting it should have the ability to scale it should have the ability to notify and coming to the next part it should also not create a tool proliferation within your org and this is one of the biggest enterprise security requirements that i have seen of late one of the big problems today is that you have too many tools you have one tool for this one learning tool that does this one learning tool that does that you have an lms that you have purchased you want people to use that because it has centralization of reporting and so on so the problem is that you have too many tools and those tools don't really play well with each other they don't play well with each other because they don't follow industry standard methodologies in many ways to address those tool proliferation issues so now let's talk a little bit about the needs now when it comes to the needs there are some very specific needs that you need to think about so from an from an engineering focus what you need is training that is engineering first they need hands on training on real world not just some spot the bug kind of stuff spot the bug is is okay there's nothing wrong with spot the bug but it is only one small part of the problem and remember developers want to see something real they don't want to see something that is just a spot the bug based on no context i want to understand something that i deal with real world in my life so that is something that you need to have so real world hands on updated content now remember when all of the stuff is changing so fast the stuff that we use the stuff that we build the platforms that we use are changing so quickly you obviously need updated content i have heard from many of my clients that a lot of the tools out there don't update the content for 3 4 years and here we are adding content every month sometimes multiple times a month in fact most of the times multiple times a month and i don't know how they would do that any other way you have to have updated content because it just doesn't work without updated content across multiple domains it needs to happen there's no question about it and of course content and labs across all these levels of skills now you're dealing with different roles you're dealing with different skill levels within these roles you're also dealing with different kinds of mapping of skills so you need to have multiple levels of skills multiple types of skills being addressed in the way you do role based security training and of course you need something for cloud security because cloud security is a slightly different problem a lot of people bring down cloud security to code and say that if you fix the terraform code you're done or if you fix the infrastructure as code you're done that's not true cloud has a lot of inherent misconfiguration possibilities all of these things you need to deploy and see and understand how they manifest so which means that your cloud security content has to have a deployment first approach right so that is something that we see with uh, this when it comes to too many tools you need to have additional things that you can do so first of all i would say that if your organization has a learning management system definitely centralize around that learning management system simply because that is your single source of truth so the more tools you proliferate and add the more complicated it's going to get 
Now, all learning management systems, like 99% of them have LTI capabilities or deep linking capabilities that allow you to embed content from different sources. Now, if you have this, there is no reason why you can't have dynamic or extremely interesting content embedded directly into your LMS. Now, this gives you multiple benefits. One, it gives you the benefit of deep linking your content and the LMS becomes a single source of truth and it becomes the single point of contact for your engineering team to learn things. The second thing is through deep linking, it also gives you the ability to customize content. One of the things that we have seen, especially with AppSec Engineer's latest LTI integration is that a lot of people are able to pick and choose videos and labs and create completely different material for themselves out of that, which is a very interesting approach that we've seen with our customers. So it's, it's very nice to see that. So it gives you multiple benefits to use these sort of tools to make your life a lot easier and to reduce the tool proliferation where you can only get to that one tool and lots of the times that tool is embedded as part of your HRMS, things like that becomes much easier to just learn from there and still have the benefit of the rich content from something else, right? So that is the benefit that you have with LTI and interoperability tools. From a scaling and monitoring perspective, definitely reporting is going to be one of the biggest things that you need. Now, this has to have multiple dimensions. It has to capture team-related statistics. Now, I would say that the way you need to think about reporting as a secure coding training platform is the way marketing automation does. Every single dimension is measured. You have analytics for every single dimension, every single type of event that happens. Only then you get a rich tapestry of data that you can present to the administrator. And that administrator can leverage this either directly on the platform or through the API, you know, that they can pull it into different BI tools and start doing things with it, you know, slicing and dicing the data and so on. And of course, keep them motivated, right? So one of the things that we have started to see, especially with our customers, is that since they have badges and credentials that they can create based off of this, they can literally roll out these exams and certifications and do incentivization very automatically through this. And people like it, right? Technology folks like to showcase their achievements on LinkedIn and so on. So that creates a very powerful incentive for your organization to drive and say that, look, the more number of certificates and badges you get by doing these trainings, the more we are going to be able to incentivize you. Or you can incentivize yourself by the kind of learning that you're doing and you're expanding your career prospects. So that is something that you create a very strong, very individualistic incentive within people by doing things like this credentialing program. So one of the things that you need to think about is gamification, but not gamification in the trite way that you do it most of the time. You want to encourage gamification that creates positive reinforcement. So one of the things that you want to do with things like streaks or every time somebody does something, finishes something, they get some kind of a notification. Or they get that small dopamine hit that gives them the feeling that they've actually done something. They're happy with doing something. So that really helps you know drive more adoption for things like this, for initiatives like this. And of course, strategic notifications. You have to have capabilities where administrators and learners are notified of their requirements to finish this, right? So only then it makes a lot of sense for people to drive this because other Otherwise, they don't have the tools to drive this within their organizations. So that is something that you need to add. One of the things that we've done is basically leverage a lot of the AI where it matters. So things like personalization, creating curated content, creating customized challenges is something AI can help us a lot with. And we have done that quite extensively. And that has really helped. People have seen a huge benefit of leveraging AI for things like this, which is for areas that require the user to actually get the user interested in doing something because they are used to it. They like it. They are more keen on this sort of material. AI can leverage in terms of recommendations and personalization and so on. Now, role-based training, and this is something that I encourage all of you to steal. I have created this mind map just to give you an idea of the different roles and the different type of content that you should feed into these roles. And by the way, you can do this all entirely yourself, but if you want us to do it, please reach out to us and we can definitely help you doing this quite extensively. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that different sort of people require different sort of skills. And if you see the kind of skills they need, there are some common factors. There are also some differentiating factors. So if you're looking at developers versus, let's say, architects, they need different types of skills. They don't necessarily need the same type of skills. Developers need more tactical skill sets like you secure, with secure coding and container security and advanced apps and so on. Whereas architects would probably need a slightly more higher level set of security skills around threat modeling, architecture, cloud security, and so on. 
Security engineers, for instance, will need a lot more automation focused stuff as well as AppSec focused stuff. So they kind of have, they walk two worlds, somewhere between what DevOps engineers do and developers do. So they still have an engineering first approach, but they have a more automated security automation element to their learning objectives. Right? So we've seen that this typically works really well. A lot of people, a lot of companies within, you know, our AppSec engineer portfolio want to do security champions and they'll be executing security champions trainings all over the place. And one of the things that works for them is a combination of content, which is kind of cutting across application security, cutting across threat modeling, compliance, DevSecOps, all of these things make for a good security champions program that scales over time, right? So if you look at it, you're really seeing different people having different types of training needs. And all of these exist within your own org, within your own team, within your own business unit. And all of these people need it because if they don't have it, they'll end up missing out on it. And your organization is not able to release more secure software because. So today the entire focus is on developer, which is fine. A lot of the focus being on developers makes sense, but there are lots of other roles where security training is completely ignored. And that's a problem. This needs to be expanded because if you don't expand this, you are going to have actual security issues going under the radar because these people who are responsible for extremely critical problems don't get the training that they need. And that's really why it sucks. So one of the reasons that you should think about this in a more structural, and meaningful way is because you need to get different types of people trained on different types of areas. And that needs to be relevant. That needs to be hands-on. That needs to have report. That needs to have the scaling capabilities. That needs to have incentivization. So there's a lot of different elements that go into making a very powerful role-based security training. So that is something that I wanted to say. And with that, I come to the end of the webinar that we have today. I hope you folks found it useful. If you need any additional information on any of this, please feel free to DM me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. And if you want this more mind map uh, for yourself, please let me know and I'll be happy to share it. I'll also be sharing the slide deck on my socials pretty soon. Thank you for joining in and thank you for watching it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.